Yeah. Okay, sorry. And then my my dogs heard that I was recording and so they started barking. Okay, so oh sorry. Okay, today we have with us Morgan Ely. Their daddy's not doing a very good job of getting them quiet. Okay, today we, we have with us for the second time doing a webinar. Morgan graciously did a webinar for us uh, last year, and it was so popular. And um, people, even three, six months later, were emailing to ask me, Does, do you remember when Morgan had a rubric? I'm still interested in that. So you're in for a real treat. We also invited her to join us in Cincinnati at the um, National Health Science Conference at the end of October. And she provided two presentations there and she's full of energy and she certainly is an expert about literacy strategies. And we hope she'll um, give you some great information that you'll be able to integrate into your health science program. With that, I'm gonna hand Morgan the microphone and she'll take questions. You can put them in the chat. I'll be helpful to her in making sure she sees your information. If there's something um, that you want, you can put that she mentions, you can put your email in the chat because I'll provide that with her. I'll provide that to her following today's presentation as well. So Morgan, thank you again for agreeing to do this. We uh, look forward to what you have to share today. You're welcome. Thank you. Can, every, can you hear me okay? Okay. All right. Hi, guys. Um, like Miss Nancy said, my name's Morgan Ely, and I um, do a lot with literacy, but um, today I want to focus on literacy strategies for the health science classroom. Um, I am from the University of Central Missouri, which is in Warrensburg, Missouri, so it's about 45 minutes outside of the Kansas City area. Um, and my email is at the bottom of the screen here, um, but I'll also have it again if you need it at the end. Um, I think it's important to tell you why I feel like I know what I'm talking about, because I know that that can be kind of a question that people bring up, like, why is this person telling me these things? So like I said, I'm an instructor of literacy at UCM in Warrensburg, and I'm in charge of all of the content area literacy courses. So basically, no matter what content area a student is preparing to teach, I teach them how to put literacy strategies into their curriculum. I'm certified fifth through 12th in grade, um, fifth through 12th grade language arts and K-12 reading. I taught seventh and eighth grade language arts for 10 years in a middle school here in Kansas City. Then I was the reading, reading specialist for two years and I've been at the university um, for six years. Um, I'm also a mom. John Ryan is nine and he's in third grade and Cooper is seven and he's in second grade. During COVID, um, we had virtual school like many of you did. Um, and it was really eye-opening to me um, to see the needs that teachers have. Um, I've been in the classroom a long time, but just even being removed for a little while, it helps um, when you go back and think, hmm, what do we really need to do to get back to the basics? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so as teachers were asked to not only see our own perspectives, but the perspectives of each of our students, um, and it's really challenging when all of our students learn in different ways, but we're asked to meet the needs of all of them at the same time. So I just wanted to put this picture up to give you something to think about. Um, this picture is a little bit of my jumping off point that I've used several times. Um, I always ask people, what do you see in this picture? Um, and do you see more than one thing? Um, do you see something different than others do? And why do some people see it one way and some people see it another? So if you're not familiar with this picture, um, you can kind of tell that this is an older woman. This is her chin down here next to the, the feathers um, and her pointed nose. And then it's also a young woman facing toward the back with her nose um, pointed away from us with like a feathered cap. Um, so it's just a way to think about how everybody looks at things differently. Uh, the goals that I have for us today um, is just to offer activities to support all of the learning styles you're going to come across, um, demonstrate different app strategies for you to take to your classroom tomorrow if you want to. Um, I'm going to give you hands-on activities um, and then also answer any questions. So let's get into it. Uh, the following activities I have are classroom ready. 
Um, all of these activities are things that I have either collected from conferences or colleagues or books that I've read, and then I've altered them in some way to fit the needs of my students. Um, so I would like to give you the opportunity to feel free to change or alter them in any way you see fit if you want to use them in your classroom. Um, and I know Nancy said that if you um, have questions, you can put them in the chat. I'm more than happy to go back and go over something again. Um, also, if you include your email address, I'm more than happy to not only send you the presentation, but any rubrics, um, because I think uh, teachers are the best thieves, right? I mean, stealing um, great ideas from other educators is how we really reach out to all students. So I'm in, I am just going to go ahead and get into it. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over different activities that I've used in my not only my um, middle school classroom, but also in my post-secondary classroom, um, mainly for um, different literacy projects and uh, helping different st or students with different learning styles achieve the same goal. So the first thing that I want to talk about is vocabulary. I think this is really easy to do and it comes into play often, especially when textbooks are given um, that may be a little higher than the reading level um, of your students, but also um, when there is a lot of text. So this one is called the word leveler. Um, it's just a quick and dirty vocab collector. It's on three levels. So what I have students do is take out a sheet of paper or I even have them use their Chromebooks or iPads, whatever technology we have. Uh, they make three columns. The first level is words that are easy. Level two is words that make them go, hmm. And then level three is when they say, is that even a word? Is it in the dictionary anywhere? Um, so once I have them collect those words, we move them to a word wall. This, um, these are two examples of word walls. I am definitely a person of the word wall on the left that's very linear and it's very structured. Um, and then there are people who are on the right. I think that if I was in the classroom during COVID, my word wall would be on the right. <laughs> um, it, this just shows that it doesn't matter what you do um, as far as organization with a word wall, but if you keep the words, if you keep the vocabulary visible to your students, they're more likely to use it in their everyday conversations, in their language, um, and also ask questions about it when um, in fact they have actually seen it again instead of just passing it over. So after we do the vocabulary collector, um, I have them create a word wall in my room that stays up all year um, and we put all of our vocabulary up there. Um, the, this next section, um, I don't know if you remember the game Minute to Win It. It was one of my favorite shows when I was younger, um, but people had to do kind of crazy activities um, to um, win money um, and they get one minute to complete the task. So I like to do um, what's we call it minute to when it's sorting. I took red solo cups and I wrote vocabulary words on the bottom of the, these red cups. Um, I mixed them all up and stacked them up. And then I put the students in groups. They had to unstack the cups, alph alphabetize them, stack them back up and be finished in one minute. Um, and then we go through and see not only if they're correct, but if they know what the words actually mean. Um, it's kind of a silly game, but it also gives them a chance to learn the spelling of words um, and also work together as a team. Um, this is in my post-secondary um, ELA class and they loved this. I did it with every piece or every unit of um, new vocabulary. On that same note, I did something called Word Doctors. This is also a minute to win it game. I took prefixes and suffixes and roots and I printed them on bones, just little paper bones, and then I cut the bones apart. Um, for this, the, I bought them um, surgical masks, which most students come with masks these days, so that um, wouldn't be an expense you would have to um, use. But then I also gave them surgical gloves and tweezers. I set a three minute timer and they had to match the broken bones together in as many ways as they possibly could. For example, they would match a suffix to a root um, and then they there would be a recorder. Um, I've done this with synonyms. I've done it with um, roots. I've done it with um, definitions. 
Um, so this is just a fun hands-on activity instead of just copying out of a book. The next one is called Alpha Boxes. Um, this is kind of a two-part uh, activity. The first one is um, part of it is that I hand out a piece of paper or again, I have them do it on our Chromebooks or whatever they have. Um, they have to find a word in our new piece of text for every letter of the alphabet. Um, you know, words let, that start with A, B, C, those are pretty simple, but when you get to, you know, the X and the Q, those are more difficult. But um, after they um, collect these words, we go through and again, put them up on our word wall. But before we do that, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> before we do that, I have them do the trash compactor. And so as a class, we decide if it's a word that means something and will help us in our unit that we're on, or if it's something that we could just toss to the side and maybe pick up later. Um, and so if I am really prepared that day, I like to have them write these words on note cards. Um, and then my husband lets me take his leaf blower to school and I blow all of the trash um, vocabulary out the door to just kind of symbolize that we want to keep the important words close and the other ones we can put off to the side. Um, this is just a basic T chart. It is um, something that has I've used more often than I thought I would. I changed this to be called a known to me as chart. Whenever I was younger and I was in elementary school and even in high school, I remember getting, getting a list of vocabulary words and then the teacher handing me a dish, dictionary and saying, okay, look up the word and then use it in a sentence. Well, then whenever I would write the sentence, it wouldn't have any context to what I was actually learning. So I had no idea what the vocab word was. So I've changed this and on the left side, I have them write down vocabulary or phrases that are new to them. And then on the right side, I have them explain how they would use it or how it's known to them. So I also have them work in pairs for this. I like to have the students talk to each other because maybe it is a word or a piece of text that they've heard before, but they just need to hear it again before they remember. Um, and this is just an easy way for them to jot down notes. It's just another note taking strategy that um, I have them use and then we can file that away so they can look back on it later. But again, I have them take these vocab words and we put them on our word wall. So just in the first couple of weeks of a semester or a school year, my word wall is full. I dedicate an entire wall of my classroom to the word wall. Um, I think it's really important to have it grow as big as it possibly can. Uh, on the same uh, level as a graphic organizer, this is another one that's really popular. It's a KWL chart, but I've changed it to KRUQ. I actually uh, learned this trick from a presenter at a conference, a literacy conference, and um, she told us that it didn't matter what your columns were called as long as you were able to teach your students to organize their thoughts. So instead of the um, what do you know, what do you want to learn, um, and what you did learn columns, I have them do what do you know about a topic, what have you read or heard about a topic, what do you understand about a topic? And then what questions do you still have? That's just an easier way, um, an easier cycle for them um, than coming up with the what do they know, what do they want to know, and what did they learn? Because that middle part gets them caught up and they feel a little overwhelmed. And again, this is a chart that can be altered in any way you want. You can change those columns to anything that helps you. Um, this is a twist on a Socratic seminar. This is called a class council meeting. Um, I like to stir up debates in my classroom, not um, over anything that is too serious, but I like to help my students form um, opinions that are educated because in our world today, um, people like to give their opinions about lots of things, but sometimes they're not educated. And so um, if I teach my students how to be educated and give evidence behind their feelings, then I think that will take them farther. So for this activity, it's a little bit of a twist on a Socratic seminar. I propose a question that creates different opinions. Um, I like to place my desks or my tables in a circle and let the class council meeting start. I always ask a student beforehand if they would um, be kind of the leader, get things kicked off. I might even slip them a piece of paper with a couple of pre, um, 
pre-made questions on it. Um, and then I just allow them to talk about their feelings on a specific topic. Um, after the students have finished their discussions, then I have them write a summary about what they experienced. It doesn't have to be a thousand word essay. It doesn't have to be um, super structured, but just getting their thoughts on paper. The two links that are at the bottom of this are actually uh, links to topics and thought provoking questions that you could use in your classroom tomorrow if you wanted. Um, and my next slide, I'm going to give you an example of something that I like to use. Uh, should PE be required for all students? So then I have my students sit around and talk about it. It's really interesting to understand where they're coming from on a topic such as this, because I have the kids who did really well in PE growing up and I have the kids who dreaded it every day. Um, it just, it's something that we've all experienced at one time, a PE class, um, exercise in general, and everybody has a personal feeling about it. So after we talk about it, <clears throat> excuse me, I have them summarize it. And then we discuss those summaries if they want, if not, then they can just hand them into me. And this shows me that they have actually participated um, without me at having to grade a bunch of papers. Um, I can go around and look and see who's actually participated in the conversation. And that to me is just as important as submitting a piece of paper. This next activity is called sculpting thoughts. So I like to use those thought provoking questions that are on the page before. I pair students up who feel similarly to one another and then I give them a tub of Play-Doh. It's really fun to see the look on a college student's face when you hand them a tub of Play-Doh. They're like, who is this lady? She's super crazy. So what I have them do is I have them do a sculpture of some kind, um, expressing their thoughts on a question. And at, after everybody is done sculpting their representation, I have one of the students who is the sculptor and the other person who's a docent. So a docent is somebody who walks around a museum and shows you different sculptures and explains things. So they have to be on the same page about what they're trying to portray in their thoughts. And then we share at the end. And it's really fun because it's an opportunity to get those kids who are very kinesthetic learners um, paired with kids who uh, are more verbal. Um, and it really helps them to understand different points of view based on representation. <clears throat> Excuse me. This next one is, I, I don't know if you've noticed, but I really like hearing my, the opinions of my students. I like to gauge the kind of people they are from the very beginning. So this is called barometer of opinions. I set my tables up in kind of a U shape. Um, I make a statement that causes students to develop a strong opinion. So they're either going to really disagree, really agree, or just be kind of neutral. So depending on where they stand on a topic, I have them line up around the room and then they have to defend their stance using an I statement. I believe, or I know, or things like that. And it gives that ownership back to their opinions and why they believe the way they do. Um, especially with young adults, I think it's really incredible to see or to actually to hear how many students say, well, my parents told me or my friends told me. So instead making them use those I statements uh, really allows them to take ownership and accountability for, for what they're doing and what they're talking about. Um, in my classes, I also do um, textbook scavenger hunts. I know that this is easier at the post-secondary level because I'm able to choose my textbooks and I know that this varies for every um, district and grade level. Um, but what I do is I have my students go ahead and um, I bring in several textbooks that could fit the class. Um, and then we do textbook scavenger hunts, just very basic questions like what's the title, look on page 74, tell me what the subheading is. And then we talk about them and then they decide as a class if they think the book would help them or just be another thing that they're forced to read. Um, this is really um, a way for me to get to know not only the students and what they really enjoy doing, but also their uh, comprehension levels, uh, what texts they find more um, appropriate for them. Um, there have been several semesters that I've kept more than one textbook. 
and also um, just split my class between those textbooks and, the, and then they're able to really look at what they are interested in. Because if they're interested and invested, then they're gonna read it. Um, they're more likely to read it, I guess I should say. Um, this, these are activities that I use when I want them to create a main idea for me. Um, many students, no matter what grade level they're in, um, in kindergarten, first grade, they should start learning about what the main idea of something is. But I can tell you that my juniors in college still cannot tell me what a main idea of an article is. So I've taught them the, the high five technique. And what they do is after they read a piece of text, they have to answer these five questions. The who, the what, the where, the when, the why, and the how. And then we take that and we create their own main idea based on those answers. So we'll go through and talk about what's important, what characters are important, what um, setting is important, um, the how of an article and, and why is that important. And then we'll just take out the rest of the stuff and focus on those main points. On that same line, um, when I have students leaving my classroom, I'm sure you all do this too, um, they need to give me exit tickets sometimes if I just need a quick kind of overview of how they've done that day. Um, so I have them do social media summaries. These are not things that I actually post on social media, but it's kind of a lingo that I can um, use to help them understand what I'm looking for. Because every time I assign a writing assignment, I have students say, well, how long does it have to be? How many um, words do I have to include? So how many pages? So instead of that, I use social media. So if I want a long post or a long response, I tell them I want a Facebook post. Um, if I want a shorter post, but I want an illustration with it, then I want an Instagram post. If I want less than 200 characters, I want a Twitter post. And if I want to make it something even better, not better, sorry, longer, um, I have inc started incorporating Snapchat, which are little just videos, uh, 30 seconds or less. Um, many of them will just send me Snapchats like on email um, of just them reviewing or summarizing what we did in class that day. They email it to me, I see it, we're done. Um, and then now I've started having them do TikToks. Um, again, I don't post this on social media, but it just gives them kind of a link of what I'm expecting. So TikTok videos can be up to three minutes long. Um, and same thing, they like to send me little video clips um, and it's more of a conversation than it is actually a paper. This next part um, is called six word memoirs. It goes along with those summaries. Um, I do this at the end of a really big unit. Um, Ernest Hemingway was charged with the um, task of writing a story in six words. And what he did was he said, baby shoes for sale, never worn. Now where that's super depressing, everybody understands what he's trying to say. Um, and so I've had my students come up with their own six word memoirs. So I'm gonna show you um, a clip. I hope it works. This is, Can you hear that? I just paused it, but can you hear it? Okay. We could hear it. Okay. So that was just an example, and that's not actually from my class, but there's lots of examples online. I just liked it because it was short and there was music 
So um, I have my students come up with their own six word memoirs. I've had them write them on their fingers before and like hold up the fingers. Um, I've had them write them on the palms of their hand and I take pictures of them like that. And then I put together a montage. Um, my favorite thing to do with the six word memoir is I have them do a memoir about their entire semester. And I have them come up with a reflection or a piece of advice that they want to give to the next semester. And then the very first class of my following semester, I show them that video. Um, and it just kind of bridges a, a connection that they are not the first students here. They're not going to be the last. And um, it's absolutely doable and um, something that you should be invested in. OK, uh, the next thing uh, I know I touched on Play-Doh a little while ago. Um, I have two boys, like I said, and I have a ton of building material. Um, they're starting to outgrow those, which makes me sad. But kinetic sand, Play-Doh, Legos, Lincoln Logs, uh, blocks of any kind. I like to just throw out a bunch of a different um, medium to use and ask my students to build a representation of something. So this is a representation of literacy. Um, this was done in my uh, sophomore uh, English language arts block. I asked them to build a representation of literacy and then explain it. Um, it's really fun to watch their brains work and figure out how they're going to represent something so vague with tiny little blocks. Um, and they, it's, it's really fun. Um, this seems overwhelmingly useful in today's society um, and classroom because literature seems overwhelming sometimes to students, especially when we give them really big manuals or heavy textbooks. Um, so I've started having my students become an expert. I like to divide my students into groups of three or four. Um, and then I assign that group of three or four, um, three or four pages of a chapter. And then they themselves divide that group of pages between themselves. And that person is in charge of learning everything they need to know about that one section. The next day when we come to class, I have them switch groups and teach other people about the pages that they read. And so by the end of the class, they're not only sharing the, what they have read, but also learning what the other people have become an expert on. Um, I like to take this one step farther too. I have them take notes when they do this, um, and then they'll do things like put a star next to things they think are really important. Once I collect those, I like to include those on tests or quizzes. Um, and I've even gone so far as having the students write um, exam questions based on the section that they were responsible for becoming an expert for. Um, and then they are super invested in helping the other people learn what they read about. Um, so that's, that's a really fun activity. And it doesn't make things seem so daunting because even if we want to say that students are going to read a 25 to 50 page chapter in a night, the likelihood is very low. Um, I have stopped using the um, come in the next day after you read something and write a paragraph about what you read the night before and then turn it into me. I've started using social media platforms um, that I have set to private. A colleague and I um, did a, a senior block not very long ago, and um, this is actually um, a science gr a group of future science teachers, and they had to develop a unit based on um, a book. It was uh, Code Orange. And what I did is I grouped them into group me chats. It's a free app, um, and you can set all the privacy settings. Um, and I have students discuss their reading on the group me chat and include me in their group. Um, and then I can go through and see what their responses are. They ask questions here. They give statements, um, concerns. And then all I have to do is heart something. And then at the end of a unit, I can go back, open my group me app and just count how many hearts somebody has to make sure that they've participated as much as they should. This also gives me an opportunity to um, just kind of see who is, might not be fitting in the mix. 
there are a lot of situations where people loathe being in groups because one person pulls more weight than another. And this keeps them accountable because I can actually be a part of the conversation instead of just listening to someone quote unquote tattle on someone else in their group. Um, another presentation tool I like to use is called Gallery Walk. Um, the Pre-COVID, I used to serve food. I don't know if we can do that anymore, but um, I would set it up like an art gallery. Um, I had students set up their presentations. I don't know if you can tell in this picture, but it's a trifold. And then they also had to have a technology component. And there's an iPad sitting there. Um, they were doing a unit project. They had to develop a unit for their content area. Um, using novels, and it can be used for a culmination of any large product, project, um, but students are responsible for going around and they will give a critique, a question, um, and also something positive about a presentation, um, and then the people who, um, the people get that feedback from their peers, um, and then kind of as a group talk about what they learned from a project or things that they wish they could have done differently. Um, I have the students really become engaged and be more spectators than peers. I know that sounds kind of odd, but I just want them to be more of a part of each other's education instead of just um, sitting by. So this group work really means a lot to me and my students and watching them grow together. On the same note, um, whenever we're choosing novels, I don't know how many of you uh, do reading in your classroom or reading by choice, but I do something called the genre cafe. Uh, I like to set red and white tablecloths on the tables with little baskets of cookies. And um, then I have them quote unquote, taste some books. So they go around to all the tables and they just check out some titles that are on the tables. And then I um, use this that's uh, I usually have it set up in a Google form. They rate a title from one to five of how much they would enjoy reading that book. Um, and then the title and then some notes um, and also why they really want to read it. This is how I group my students when it comes to reading. Uh, I don't do a, a ability level. Um, I don't do a comprehension level. I do interest level um, because if a kiddo doesn't like what they're reading, they're probably not going to read it. So this gives me an idea of what they're interested in. It's just one more piece that I use to help students become more engaged. This is called a boggle of ideas. Uh, after students finish a unit, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be just a reading unit. It doesn't have to be a novel or um, anything like that. It can really be um, any kind of reading. <clears throat> excuse me, um, I have my students brainstorm a list of a certain topic. So different characteristics, different list of characters, excuse me, questions, facts, et cetera. Um, I set a time limit and then we go around and we, we talk about what we've put on our list. And if someone's idea is repeated, the person who also had it written down has to cross it off their list. And then at the end, we <coughs> excuse me, and we um, group all of our thoughts together. We usually throw them up on our word wall. <coughs> I'm so sorry, I have a tip on my throat. Um, we usually throw all the stuff up on our word wall um, so we can keep things um, visual. Uh, I like to make it a competition for kids um, to see how many different topics we can come up with. This is one of my favorite activities. So I really, really hope that you guys are interested in doing this in your class. So I, um, like I said, I was an ELA teacher for 10 years. After year two of grading 165 research papers every semester, I was done. I couldn't do it anymore. I lost my emotional enthusiasm when it came to APA citations. I just, I, I didn't have it in me anymore. So I created this thing called Team Research and Debate. So what I do is I create a research project with two of opposing views. I did the same lessons that I did before. You know, I talked about how to do research. I talked about the pros and the cons and being for and against something. I talked about making sure that you're doing research for both sides. 
Um, and then, and I have them in groups while they're doing this. And then at the very day that they're supposed to come and present and debate about their topic, I have them flip the script, which means that they have to then defend the opposite view. So if they are um, for for something, then they have to um, they have to debate against it. So because you have to teach both sides of research, if they've done their homework and they've worked really hard and you flip it on them, then they should be prepared. Uh, the best part of this is that a lot of people say, how do you do this more than once? Well, sometimes I flip it and sometimes I don't, and they never know which one I'm going to do until they come to class that day. Uh, this is another presentation. I just had my uh, juniors, um, my post-secondary juniors do this, and it was really fun. It's called a serial presentation. So um, I have students read either a piece of text or a novel or something, um, and then they have to create a new serial for it. So instead of the uh, uh, Rice Krispies, this is the Wright Krispies. Um, and then I have them do things like they have to create the cover of the cereal box. They have to put all the information down one side about the, um, about the characters. And on the other side is the synopsis. And on the back are reviews. Um, and at the top, on the top lid is a citation. And it's just a fun way for them to get their hands on things that they can actually present um, in a fun way. This is another research topic. Um, it's called Genius Hour. One of my colleagues did this, introduced me to Genius Hour, and I it is exactly that. It is genius. So uh, students select any topic, any topic that they want. They can talk about how to play the guitar. They can talk about um, how to open a uh, pet shelter. They can talk about showing horses, whatever is interesting to them. And then students are going to select a way that they're going to showcase their knowledge. They can either, um, they can put on a show of some kind, they can write a song, they can make a movie, whatever they want to do. Then students do their own research. They design their own rubrics and plans and come up what they need, with what they need. Um, and then at the end of a semester, they present it. I give them one hour every week to work on their projects, but outside of class, they need to be worked on it as well. It's a very independent activity. It's all student led, um, but there is absolutely teacher guidance. So this activity gives me an opportunity to work side by side with all of my students um, one on one. So I'm able to figure out what they need, um, if they're having, if they're struggling in some way, if they're stuck, but again, it goes back to that student engagement. If they're interested in something, then they're going to be more um, in touch with it. And this is a really um, awesome, I, I love presentation day of Genius Hour because it's just fun to watch them be so proud of themselves. Um, I included a couple of links to some tech tools that I use for collaborations. I have my students use pictochart.com. It's for infographics. Visme is a way to design uh, presentations. Padlet is like a digital sticky wall, a sticky note wall. Um, and it uh, lets those sticky notes have images, links, anything. Um, and these are all hyperlinks. So if you do get the prep presentation, feel free to just click on those um, and it'll take you right to it. I didn't just throw in some apps. These are actually apps that I've used and they worked for my students. Um, so, uh, definitely check those out. Here are some tech tools for creating visual content. So, uh, clips, um, is for short videos. Um, it's for making fun videos on Chromebooks. So if you are a Chromebook school, uh, this works instead of like iMovie. So you can download clips. Time Toast Timeline Maker is a timeline presenter. Um, they, I have my students create a lot of timelines. Um, and this is also a free site. And then of course, iMovie students really enjoy that. WeVideo is, I'm so sorry, this, not Clips. Uh, Clips is an app, but WeVideo is the Chromebook user platform. Um, and then TouchCast Studio is interactive videos also, and that's for the iPad. So if you're an iPad school, that would be a good app for that. 
Okay, my last section is about um, types of note taking. Um, whenever I have my students take notes, I start very basic with an outline version, the main topic, sub -talk, topic, and then thoughts or supporting facts. And then I teach them Cornell notes. Um, I feel like that's a very linear move that they can go from very outlined to then um, a little more uh, free sketching. And then we go to mind maps. Mind maps is a graphic organizer um, that my students really like. Everybody has the same central idea in the middle um, and then they put their notes in boxes around it. Um, it's not, it doesn't have to be neat. It doesn't have to be perfectly done. It's just a way for them to, um, to get all of their thoughts on paper. And then finally, I use sketch notes, which is by far my kids favorite to use. Sketch noting is a way for them to draw diagrams or doodle on pages or write notes, use color, um, anything that helps them. They um, absolutely gravitate towards sketch noting because they are in that time of their lives where they just are very kind of all over the place with their thoughts. And it's just about getting all of their thoughts on paper. And then we can talk about it as a whole. There's actually an incredible video on YouTube called Why Sketchnoting. Um, and it's, uh, it's a guy, I thought I had a link on here, but I don't, so I'll get that. But it's um, actually a gentleman who talks to your class as if he's there with them and he pauses so the teacher can actually interject here and there um, and you can take them through sketchnoting and how to do that. From there, I have them make their own study guides, no matter what type of notes we're taking. Um, I then um, have them make their own study guides and we talk about um, how to do a study guide, what are what's important to keep on a study guide. And this is also another opportunity I give them to submit exam questions. Um, and then, uh, then I actually do take a lot of that from their study guides, what I'm actually gonna put on the, the test. Um, here are just a few apps I wanted to throw in for struggling readers. Um, Rewordify analyzes the text for a student. Snap and Read Universal. The text can be copied and then read aloud to a student. Newzella gives different levels of Lexile for the same article. So everybody's getting the same content. It's just on their own reading level. Inspiration gives electronic graphic organizers, visual representations, and maps. Um, Okay, so I know that was really fast and Nancy, I, I can't help it. I'm just, I, I just can't stop talking, but um, I just wanna bring this full circle about the perspective. So in the very beginning of this, I talked about how our perspective changes within our classroom because we have to be constantly changing what we're seeing for our students. So I like to throw this picture up at the end and say, do you see black and blue or do you see white and gold? And no matter what you see, your students might see something different. So some questions that I want you to consider after hearing all of these activities. How does your perspective change your thought process? How can you change your classroom to help all of your students? And can using an out of the box activity help students who feel lost and also cut down on your grading? How many times do we take papers home on a Tuesday night and stay up until ungodly hours um, to get things caught up or on a weekend um, and putting some of these things online or taking away the actual written component um, and more of a conversation piece um, really cuts down on the paperwork and it gives you an opportunity to not be so weighted down with grading and more open to conversations with your students. So. Um, please drop your email in the chat if you want copies of rubrics or the presentation. Like I said, my name's Morgan Ely. Here's my email address. I'm more than happy to talk to anybody. I think one of the biggest things that I like to um, put in is that if you have a lesson plan and you want to know how to make it more interactive or put in more literacy strategies, I'm always open to be emailed and I can work with you and help you do that. So are there any questions? I have a question, and that is, where are the other fun college professors like you? <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, it's, it's just lecture, 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 or, or 
It seems like it. And I'm sure that you are a breath of fresh air to your students and they probably, yeah. Lauren says she wishes she was in your class. <laughs> and um, I just feel like you, you add such a new uh, way of learning for them. And um, we love the fact that you're still, you're doing this. I mean, I, th I believe that some of our health science teachers do more hands-on and more uh, student involvement and flip kind of classrooms, but I feel like not so much at the post-secondary. So mm -hmm. we're so glad that you um, are adding value to their uh, college experience. Well, I think it's very daunting um, to, especially uh, post, even high school and post-secondary, um, we're very focused on our objectives and what the state or whoever tells us what we have to teach. And we forget that even though these students are almost out into the real world, they still love assignments that could even work for elementary kids. I mean, how often do you go to a professional development and somebody actually pulls out a game or an activity and it's actually a little bit exciting for a second? Um, that's how our students work. You know, they want, they want that opportunity to feel like a kid again, because when we're kids, we love to learn. We love learning. And then as we grow up, we think I have to learn. Does that make sense? Like instead of becoming these sponges that just want more and more information, it's like, Oh, I have to go to that meeting. Well, how can we get our students to then be those people who incorporate activities to keep things fun? I think that's kind of my goal. Yeah, there was a, um, <clears throat> we have Chris with us. Chris works with um, Cengage National Geographic Learning and um, she's often comes to our webinars and we're glad that she does. And she, um, she made a comment, the social media um, activity that you use. Hey, Chris, you like me calling you out like that, right? <laughs> and so, yeah. So I just, why don't you tell her what you said about um, when those different ways she uses social media. Well, they're just so relevant. And I come from an ELA, ELA background, literacy background too. So it's just really refreshing to see these things and think about the many ways they can be applied to CTE and health science and all of this stuff. So it's, it's great. Just loved it. Oh, yeah. good. Thank you. I, I agree. I not actually, when I went to Cincinnati and I talked about our social media um, summaries. I only talked about Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And actually in Cincinnati, somebody said, what about Snapchat and TikTok? And I was like, oh, that's a good idea. So since then, I've taken that back to my classroom and my students are all over it. They have done dances. They have done just little snap videos and emailed it to me. I mean, they're emailing me videos of themselves, not talking about anything related to my class. They're just like, Hey, Mrs. Ely, just wanted to let you know that, you know, I saw this billboard and things were spelled wrong and it made me think of you, you know, just little things. And it's just that connection that we all crave so much, especially in this COVID's post COVID world where social media just exploded. So now we have an opportunity to really like grab onto that and turn it into something. Um, Morgan, you know that I'm all about being your agent and um, I, <laughs> I could see that. I could see you going to a school district or a um, professional development where there were all health science teachers or CTE teachers, or you could do like a day long where they actually did these activities, you know, where they actually got in groups and maybe you've done that, but um, where they, they actually got in groups and they did some of them because I know that the teachers here are going to you know, get your um, presentation and they're going to take some of that back to their classrooms, but it's so cool when they get to kind of practice it. I could see you being engaging and entertaining for a, a day long type I of would, I would love that. So everybody on this webinar, go tell the people all around, like call me, send me wherever I'm coming. Yeah. Yes, I just, Kelly, I will be there. It's yeah. Amazing. And um, our friend Deborah from Oklahoma, she's telling me to tell Laura Morris, she's um, the health science state leader there in Oklahoma to ha have you there because um, it, in we get, you know, when we go to professional development, it's a lot of lecture, you know, because it's like, go to this one, go to that one. And so if, if you were there for an extended time, then they could actually do some of this and then, then they remember it. 
you know. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think um, one of the conferences that I went to when I was in, um, when I was in, I think I was a first or second year teacher, the conference that I went to actually, we left. And during the breakout section sessions, we actually created the activities to then take to our classrooms. Like we made them together um, and then it was ready to go. And I think that's what's so important is that we as educators are drowning, right? And if somebody can just come in and say, stop grading 165 research papers, let's teach them how to stand up for their opinion in an educated way and have a conversation. And then you're not taking time away from your family and your life, grading these papers, becoming so emotionally burnt out. And then your students feel it, right? I mean, that's just, that's just part of the game now. And it's, and it's really sad because I think there's a, a huge opportunity for us as educators to just um, tweak things a little bit to take that paper grade book away. If that makes yeah, sense. I sometimes wonder, like, how do we ever get another English teacher, Eng English language arts teacher, you know, with all the grading that they have to do. And I remember my students in health science used to do journaling after we, you know, did clinical experiences. And there was a lot of reading and I corrected it for, you know, grammar and spelling and all that, too. Very time consuming. So we love the, um, the new ideas that you've given us today. I'm going to stop the recording. And I just want to 